the way of love. To create unity in our local churches, we must be committed to building up one another in love. Here's Dr. Gene Getz. This is where Paul's heading with his uh, argument. He's building towards a very important culmination. So in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, 28, he says, look, now you are the body of Christ. He said, I've already said that. And you're individually members of it. I've already said that. I've illustrated it with the body metaphor. But he said, let me share something with you. God has placed these in the church. First, apostles. Second, prophets. And third, teachers. And later on, he calls these the greater gifts. Next, which are the secondary gifts, are miracles and gifts of healing, helping, managing various kinds of languages. Now, as you read on here, as you come to the end of the chapter, 12, 31, he says, desire the greater gifts. Now, what were the greater gifts? The greater gifts were apostles and prophets and teachers. And who were the apostles and the prophets and the teachers? Now, what you need to understand in order to understand what he's saying is he's not saying desire to be an apostle because God through Christ chose the men who are to be apostles. He handpicked them, in fact. He's not saying desire to be a prophet. And most of the apostles were also prophets. He's not even saying desire to be a teacher in the sense that the apostles and the prophets were teachers. You see, in Ephesians chapter 4, we have a, a more dis definitive uh, definition of who these people were. Because in Ephesians 4, 12, it says, And the Lord gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, which most of the apostles were, and pastors and teachers. And there he combines these two, shepherds and teachers. And he oftentimes, well, he will use the word shepherd as a, a metaphor to feed or teach the flock. He personally gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Notice, some. And who gave them? Jesus gave them. They were sovereignly bestowed. And why were they given? To train the saints in the work of ministry. For what purpose? They were given to build up the body of Jesus Christ. Now, what were they doing? Right at the very beginning of this letter, some of them were saying, we're a Paul, not a Peter. Some were saying, we're a Peter, but not of Apollos. These are the greater gifts. These were the individuals who were the greater gifts and had the greater gifts. When you read Ephesians 4, you'll see that they were the greater gifts to the church and they had the greater gifts to communicate. They were foundational gifts. And what these Corinthians were doing was rejecting the greater gifts and giving attention to those with the lesser gifts, the secondary gifts. And so when it says desire the greater gifts, what he was saying was desire, and by the way, that's the second person plural in the Greek text. You desire is really what it means. You desire, as a body, desire the greater gifts. Don't reject the greater gifts. Desire that the greater gifts be manifested in the church. That should be your priority. But then he says, but I'm going to show you even a better way than that. I'm going to show you an even better way than desiring the greater gifts. So, again, what do we have here? A misuse of their spiritual gifts. And so when you go on into chapter 13, he develops that concept of the greater way. 
And what is the greater way? The way of love. And he said, look, if I speak the languages of men, and what was the last lit one that was listed in the secondary gifts? It were the languages. And so he starts at the bottom. He says, if I speak the languages of men and of angels, but do not have love, I'm a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, you don't have love, Corinthians. Therefore, as you use that gift, it's just an uncertain sound. He goes on, he said, if I have the gift of prophecy even, and understand all mysteries even, and all knowledge, and I have all faith, and these are all the gifts that are mentioned earlier, so I can even move mountains. But if do not have love, I'm like a zero. Nothing. In essence, he's saying to the Corinthians, you reject the greater gifts, you go after the lesser gifts, and you have no love, therefore, they're meaningless. In essence, he's saying you've lost sight of the fruit of the Spirit and have focused on the gifts of the Spirit, which are supposed to produce the fruit of the Spirit, which is not happening in your church. You got the cart in front of the horse. He goes on to say, let me take it a step further. If I donate all my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body to be burned, but do not have love, I gain nothing. The greater way is the way of love, and you have not discovered that better way. Now, he's going to develop this more, but let me give you a question before we move on to what I've called reflections of love. How does Paul's first letter to the Corinthians demonstrate that spiritual gifts in themselves are not a sign of spiritual maturity? Well, if you go back to chapter 1, he said, I always thank God for you, all of you, because of God's grace. And as you read through this letter, as we studied it, you, you might draw the conclusion there's only one thing you could thank God for in the Corinthian church, and that was grace. <laughs> but he's really talking about more than that here. There's a, there's a specific meaning he has in mind with the word grace. And he explains it in the context. He said, I thank God for the God's grace given you in Christ Jesus, that by Him you were made rich in everything. How were they made rich through God's grace? As believers. In all your speaking. See, those are, that's a generalization for those speaking gifts. In all your knowledge. As the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. In other words, this was the sign of your conversion. So that you, plural, do not lack any spiritual gift. In other words, he's saying, when you were converted to Christ, God in His sovereignty verified the message of salvation by giving you all these gifts. And that's how I know you're saved. I wouldn't know you're saved except that happened. Because then he goes on in chapter 3 to say, brothers, when I was with you, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. In other words, people who operated not according to the Spirit, but according to the flesh, even as believers. You're babies in Christ. That's how I, I had to communicate with you. I, I had to feed you with a bottle. I fed you not milk, not solid food. You were not yet able to receive it. In fact, as I'm writing this letter, and as I have just received a report about you all, you're still not able because you're still fleshly. It's quite an indictment, isn't it? For since there is envy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and living like ordinary people? And what does he mean by ordinary people? Unsaved people. So, the question that I, that I gave you here is, how does Paul's first letter to the Corinthians demonstrate that spiritual gifts in themselves are not a sign of spiritual maturity? I am sure that you have heard people say that the sign of spiritual maturity are certain spiritual gifts. Well, the Corinthians had them all. But Paul couldn't even tell there were believers from the way they were living. The gifts were not given because they were spiritually mature or a sign of their spiritual maturity. This was a sovereign act of God given to these people to verify the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we misinterpret 
that, it can lead us to some very false conclusions in relationship to the subject of spiritual gifts. 